Fantastic. So we have now Tachapol Saranurak, who will be talking about expanded pruning. Thank you. Uh, the first recipient of the Press Booker Award. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. So I would like to thank everyone that have been supporting me. And I thank TCS community as well. I feel lucky to be part of this. So uh, today I would like to talk about expanders. So expanders are, roughly speaking, robustly connected graph. It's like a graph that connect well together. And it uh, occurs in many contexts, like random graph, power law graph, and something algebraic. And so more formally, expanders in this talk, I would say that the graph is a phi expander. If for any set, for any set S here, well, you have that the cut size compared to its volume is quite big. So I mean that this thing, which count the number of edges crossing the cut, the red thing here, when you compare it with the volume of the set, which basically sum, this is sum of the degree, which basically count the number of edges incident to S. So it count both cut edges and also edges inside the set. We need to say, we need that the cut edges is quite big, like five, at least five, fac five fraction compared to the volume. If this is true for every cut, then the graph is expander, is a phi expander. Okay. And, and on the other hand, if this set S, like a ha half cut size less than five fraction of the volume, then we say that this, this set is a phi sparse cut. So the graph is a phi expander if it has no phi sparse cut. That's the definition. Yeah. And so expander, they are so useful. Uh, they have been used really a lot in TCS community uh, to get a recorrecting code, pseudo random generator, and so on. It's like really, really useful. And today, I'm just going to touch on one aspect of expander. That is, expander are robust under adversarial updates. And from this, that's why they are so useful for dynamic algorithms. So in the last few years, um, there are so many dynamic algorithms that has been using expanders. And they are so effective. They can give you um, fastest algorithm for many fundamental problem, for many fundamental graph problem, minimum spanning tree, okay, connectivity, and so on. And all of this works. They have one common uh, tool, which is expanded pruning. And I want to tell you what it is today. So the statement of expanded pruning, uh, let's see. Um, by the way, like in this talk, like n is always number of vertices, m is the number of edges. And when I just said that the graph is an expander without phi, without saying what phi is, then I just usually mean that g is like 1 over n to the little 1 expander. So this is kind of big, close to 1, but um, maybe not need to be constant. Okay. So it's a quite good expander. So when this is one, this is like the best expander, best possible. Yeah. Okay. So the intuition about how expander are robust under updates, the first intuition you should have is, is like this. Suppose that the graph is not an expander, then you can find a bad, like sparse cut. That is, it might be the case that you can just delete, let's say, two edge. And then it disconnects the graph into two big components, two balanced components. So intuitively, it means that like, just by deleting few edges, then you get big change. You have two big components separated from each other. On the other hand, if the graph is an expander, right? if you delete these two edges here, you know that there are other edges connecting this cut. There is no sparse cut. So just deleting these two edges, two edges 
this will be this will not be disconnected. And even if you try to delete a bunch of edges, let's say k edges around here, you might be able to disconnect some part of the graph, but the part that is disconnected from the graph will have size proportion to, to k, to the number of deletion. So if you delete few edges, you can disconnect only small portion of the graph. So small change implies, like small updates implies small change. So that's like roughly why it's robust. So now, expanded pruning basically try to like, like push this intuition to like much further, and the setting is as follows. Suppose you start with a graph, which is an expander. Okay? And then there is one edge deletion. One edge update can be deletion or can be insertion. Um, this edge is given to you, and the algorithm will do the following. It will return you some set, p1 at time 1. And this set p will kind of grow slowly. Okay? And this set p have the following guarantee. Um, okay. It has a guarantee that um, the complement of p, when you look at, like, when you remove p and look at the complement of p, the, the compli like, look at the graph induced by the complement of p, everything outside p remain an, ex an expander. Okay. So, by the way, expander is something that you like, and this set p basically say, okay, after you're removing this part, this small part, everything else is an expander, it's good for you. Okay. Then the next update can come, Algorithm will update the set P, and again, the complement of P remain an expander, and so on. Okay? So this is the, the, the most important thing is just that this complement of P is always an expander. Okay? And the, the algorithm guarantee something about set P like this. First of all, the set P grows really slowly, Right, the volume of p at time i is something like i times some small factor. So after one update, the set p just grow by something like constant. And also we can update the set p in small time, into little one time. Okay. I hope this is uh, clear. So given like a sequence of updates, right? The algorithm just keep growing the set P, the pruning set. And you can think like each update can of cause only small problem, the set P grows slowly. And the rest of the part of the rest remaining part of the graph remain an expander. It's good for you. Okay. This is how expander is robust. Like given a sequence of updates, you are like you have a, still a large part of the graph that is still an expander. Okay. okay. And note that. Everything here is necessary, like being expander is necessary to have this kind of statement because if you have a sparse cut from the beginning, the graph is not expanded from, from the beginning. If you delete some edge, let's say you delete these two edges, then to guarantee that the complement of P is connected, you need that the set P must grow like very fast from just by deleting two edge, so that the rest is a con is connected graph, right? So P can grow slowly only if the graph is an expander. Okay. So that's the expanded pruning, and let me try to tell you a bit how, like, how to how to make this like how to how to implement this algorithm. And we will just try to look at kind of the baby version of expanded pruning. That is, it's like a one batch version of expanded pruning. So in this problem, you are given an expander, okay? And then there will be a set of HD, the set to be deleted. And let's say that G prime is just G minus D. Okay. So what you want? You want to find one set P such that, first of all, the set P should be small, should be like of size proportion to D, 
D here is like just the number of edges in the set D. This P is small, and the complement of P is still an expander, but like it's a 5 over 6 expander. It's still an expander, but get worse by a constant factor. Okay. So this is just the same problem as expanded pruning, but except that every deletion is given to you in one batch. It turns out that you can actually find this set P in time proportion to D over phi square and independent of N. Okay. So you, you start with a graph, you delete some edges, delete D, and then you can find the set P such that the complement of it is a phi over six expander in time proportion to D. So let me tell you like how to do this in high level. Um, I would first tell you an algorithm that call MacFlow, and then I tell you how to get time, which is like a, that is even independent from n. So the algorithm actually is very simple if you allow yourself to call one MacFlow. So you start with the graph, which is a phi expander. You can construct a MacFlow instance like this. For each of the endpoints of deleted HUV, you connect them to a super source here and put some capacity, doesn't matter too much, uh, some capacity which is 2 over 5. Um, doesn't matter too much because we don't have time to, for the proof anyway, but I just want to s tell you how it looks like. And for each edge, original edge in the graph G, uh, I will just set the capacity of original edge in the graph G to be 2 over 5 as well. And for each vertex in the graph, every node in the original graph, I connect it to a super sync, now with capacity, something like degree of the node U. If the node U, connect super sync to U with capacity degree of U. So that's the graph. So it's just some graph with the source and sync. And now the algorithm is just to compute min cut ST mean cut using MacFlow, right? And let's say that you get uh, a cut U and U bar such that U is like the side that contain the source. So that's the algorithm. It turns out that what you need to do next is just to set that the set pruning, the pruning set P is just going to be U minus the, the dummy source here. So this is what you return. And that's it. That's the algorithm. Um, the analysis is not too hard, but we would, not, we would not have time for this. I just want to show that this is quite simple algorithm. But the idea why it works at all is that um, basically if there is some sparse cut in the, in the graph after deletion, the flow that, can, that, that you try to push from the source must get stuck there. And the set P will kind of like identify where the sparse cut is. And the rest, like everything else that is outside of P, there will be no sparse cut. That's why the rest, the complement of P, must be an expander. Okay. okay. But you see, like the time that you take for doing this thing is like one Mac flow, which is at least linear time. You need to read uh, the graph, right? How can we hope to get something that is independent from n, from the size of the graph, like just local to, to deletion. Is this even possible in principle? Right. So I want to kind of give you some philosophy behind this thing. How is this even possible in principle? And to see this, I um, want to th you to think about an ice tray. Okay. When you have an ice tray, and imagine that you pour water pour water into ice tray. Okay. So imagine that you're just pouring water there like this. I want to say that this process is local in the following sense. The time that you t need to take to, to, to pour the water is just proportion to the volume of the source water. Like if you have like small amount of water, like the water will just flow and stop. It doesn't matter how big this ice tray is, even if it's much bigger, 
once you finish pouring the water out of, your, of the source water that you have, then the process stops. Okay. So it just depends like the time that how when the water stops, it's just independent from, from the size of the ice tray. It just depends on, on the source, how much the source you have. Okay. So now let's try to abstract the reason why this is local. Um, so the first thing is that the structure of the graph, um, in this case, like you can think of this thing as like kind of a grid. The, the ice tray is like a grid graph. Okay. Now, the structure of this graph is such that every node has large enough sink, in the sense that every cell here can absorb some, some amount of water. Right? And this is quite important because imagine otherwise, if actually no cell in this eye tray can absorb any water except maybe the last one here, everything else is like a full, you cannot absorb anything. If you try to pour the water in, then Basically, the water has no way to absorb, and it just needs to like, kind of go through the whole ice tray until it finds some place to be absorbed. So just by pouring just some amount of small water, you can need to read the whole ice tray. Okay. So that's, but now, if every cell can absorb something, then like, um, you don't need to read the whole ice tray. You can have just, like, the total amount of thing the total amount of ice tray that you kind of read or the, the total the flow that goes through the ice tray kind of just proportion to the volume of the water. And next thing is that it's about how the water flow, the flow algorithm. In this case, this is how like water in our world works. That is like the node will basically forward the water to the next node, at SN1, only when it's, it's that node is, is full. Like, only when you are saturated, then that's when you, you kind of forward it to the next, to your neighbor. It's not like you, for, you put the water here and then like, it just jump to any other thing. Yeah. You just only forward it when you are full. Okay. So this is like a kind of two important reason. And now let's come back to our graph problem. Like, so I kind of showed you before that like this is a graph instance that's, that we built, right? And this abstract reason also capture what's going on here, the two abstract reasons before. But this, the structure of the graph, we need, we have, before we need that, every node need to, have, like, need to absorb some amount of water, which is the case here. Every node here has sink capacity of something like degree by design. Every node, you connect it to super sync with its degree. And this is like the right amount of thing that you want to absorb because algorithm usually spend time, like kind of spend time on the node V proportion to the degree of V. And if you kind of support, you have a sync capacity on V proportion to degree, then you kind of can charge the time of the algorithm to amount of source. And next thing is that the flow algorithm, every node should forward flow to its HSN node only when its sync capacity is saturated. So this, like, it turns out that this thing is just true for classical flow algorithm that you, that you have learned before, like um, blocking flow or push li label, the classical one actually certify this uh, property this is not certified by, by a new, new algorithm, um, um, like new near linear time or almost linear time MacFlow algorithm, but it's certified by, by the old algorithm. That's why, like, because of these two conditions, it's certified if you use blocking flow and push level. When you try to like, send push flow from this guy, right, which the total amount of source is something like d over phi, then you would basically spend time proportion to this amount of source. That's high level idea. Okay. And that's how you get the running time, which is something like d over phi square, independent from n. Okay. And this is how you get, um, you get this, um, like, so we get like this baby version of extended pruning 
and with some more amount of work, you can make it work in the sequence of updates too. Okay. And I just want to spend two more minutes, one more minute, yes. Uh, okay, on on like why expanded pruning is 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 interesting um, because it has good application. Um, so you know that okay. So there is something called expanded decomposition that basically you give given a graph, you decompose the graph into expanders by deleting small fraction of edges. And now this is so super useful and you want to maintain it under updates. And if you want to maintain it, what can you do? You just basically start with expanded decomposition and just run expanded pruning on top of each expander. Given the graph, then you given updates, then you can basically maintain this thing. And basically, by combining expanded decomposition and expanded pruning, you get the dynamic version of expanded decomposition, which give a bunch of application. And then, and this framework actually works with many other variants of expansion of, of expander, not just the expander that ex, expander version that not just the definition of ex expanded that I give in this talk. It works in directed expanded decomposition that Aaron will talk about uh, next, too. And yeah, thanks a lot. Any questions? The room is silent today. You're all very shy. Uh, so how come expanders hasn't been, I mean, this is kind of a flow of tons of different results about expanders, and expanders are around, I don't know, for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Why this is happening now? Why is it not discovered much earlier, you mean? Well, I think um, just in 2004, when only when Spielman and Tang gave like, the first fast static algorithm for expanded decomposition, only after that, then you have hope to use expander for dynamic algorithm, because you need to have fast static algorithm first. So that's why like, you, um, um, the development is only after that, yeah. Okay, good, any, yes, yeah, Anka. Just a naive question. So thank you for, 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 for the very nice talk. Are there constructions for expander graphs? When they fit? That, constructions? Yes, thanks, thanks. Um, so ex the construction, explicit construction of expander graph have been studied like way, way before like uh, this kind of development. Um, and you can construct a graph that is like constant degree and has expansion. Um, constant to uh, using like many kinds of way like zigzag product or algebraic technique algebraic construction like uh, this is like uh, like something well known is called Margulis uh, expander and yeah okay. Okay. I think it's time to thank touch again thank you